Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's update on COVID-19 in New Brunswick. Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue à cette mise à jour sur le COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Les personnes suivantes prendront la parole lors de la séance d'information de cet après-midi. Le Dr. Jennifer Russell, médecin hygiéniste en chef, et le premier ministre du Nouveau-Brunswick, l'honorable Blaine Higgs. Speaking at this afternoon's press conference will be the following individuals. Dr. Jennifer Russell, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, and the Honorable Blaine Higgs, Premier of New Brunswick. Dr. Russell. Thank you, Bruce. Merci, Bruce. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Throughout the pandemic, we have sought to protect New Brunswickers through decisions grounded in science and based on the best advice and evidence available. Evidence and our data is now telling us that we have good reason to be concerned about the spread of COVID-19 in New Brunswick, particularly in Zone 1, which is the Moncton region. And we have good reason to be concerned about the course of the pandemic elsewhere in Canada and for those who regularly travel to and from regions outside the Atlantic bubble. Based on the evidence before us, I have today recommended to the Cabinet that we take new measures to slow the spread of COVID-19 in New Brunswick. We have recommended that Zone 1 transition back to the orange phase of recovery due to the increasing number of cases we are seeing in that area. The Premier will speak to the details of this change shortly. We, are also, we have also recommended new testing protocols for workers who travel outside of the Atlantic bubble. That is to ensure stricter self-isolation and to reduce the number of missed cases, which has contributed to the spread of COVID-19 in our province. Everywhere around us, in Canada and in the United States, the pandemic is intensifying. Record numbers of cases are being reported each day in Quebec, Ontario, Manitoba and Alberta. And it's also the case in the world and in the United States and our next door neighbors in Maine. Zone 1 transition to the orange phase of recovery due to the increasing number of cases we are seeing in that area. We are also recommending new testing protocols for workers who travel outside the Atlantic bubble to ensure stricter self-isolation and reduce the number of missed cases which has contributed to the spread of COVID-19 in our province. More Canadians are requiring hospital treatment, and the number of deaths in Canada attributed to COVID-19 is rising steadily. Our successes against the pandemic, gained through months of hard work and vigilance, can be lost very quickly. Uh, I just look across um, in, at Europe right now, and when we think about Italy in the first wave and how horrifying those, those photos were and the videos on social media, as well as places like New York City, uh, we never wanted that to happen here in Canada, let alone New Brunswick. But now we are seeing it happening across the country with our counterparts in other provinces, and it is heartbreaking. And if we are not careful, we will find ourselves facing the same bleak outlook as most other jurisdictions in North America. Rapidly climbing caseloads, I mean exponentially climbing, more sickness and death, and significant interventions to stop the progress of this disease. Uh, again, many places around the world are having to go into lockdown, including England and many parts of Europe. I think the only places in Europe that are doing well right now are Norway and Finland. Um, but here in North America, uh, again, I don't think there's anywhere in North America that isn't being touched in a very serious way other than the Atlantic bubble. So this is why we are acting now. We must stay ahead of the pandemic or it will overwhelm us as it has overwhelmed others. Today, there are four new cases of COVID-19 reported in New Brunswick. The new cases are as follows. There are three cases in Zone 1, two individuals aged between 20 to 29 years old, one individual under the age of 19. In Zone 2, which is the St. John region, there is one new case, an individual aged 30 to 39. 
At this time, we have 43 active cases in the province with no one currently in hospital as of our 10 a.m. report. We are also dealing with another outbreak in an adult residential facility in the province. Our PROMT team is now on site at the Residence Oasis in Dieppe, where one case of COVID-19 has been confirmed. Contact tracing is underway, and measures are being taken to limit any further spread among residents and staff at this facility. Today, there are four new cases of COVID-19 reported in New Brunswick. The new cases are as follows. There are three in Zone 1, two individuals aged 20 to 29, and one individual under the age of 19. In Zone 2, which is the St. John region, there, are, there is one new case, an individual aged 30 to 39. At this time, we have 43 active cases in the province, and as of 10 o'clock this morning, uh, from our most recent report, there is currently no one in hospital. We are also dealing with another outbreak in an adult residential facility in the province. Our prompt team is now on site at the Residence Oasis in Dieppe, where one case of COVID-19 has been confirmed. Contact tracing is underway and measures are being taken to limit any further spread among residents and staff at this facility. The situation in Zone 1 has been steadily worsening in the recent days. We have seen the number of new cases double in the past week. We currently have 8.4 cases per 100,000 people in that area, twice the rate for the province as a whole. By Zone 1, moving to the orange phase now, we hope to quickly reverse this trend. When this zone was moved to orange earlier this fall, the public's cooperation and following public health guidance enabled us to remove those restrictions after 14 days. With the same spirit of determination this time, I'm confident we will again be able to slow the spread and return this area to the yellow phase with the rest of the province. As I have said before, the COVID-19 virus cannot move by itself. It moves when people move. And it has become plainly evident that travel outside the Atlantic bubble is a major factor in the spread of COVID-19 in New Brunswick and will continue to be the case throughout the pandemic. I understand that our economy depends upon the mobility of the labour force. Some of our health service delivery depends on the mobility of the labour force. Many New Brunswickers have to travel for work to other provinces and jobs that put food on the table for many New Brunswickers depend on that. We need to balance the needs of the economy with the protection of our population. We need to balance keeping schools open, our mental health, making sure we don't overwhelm our health care system. In the summer, when case numbers were low, we reduced the self-isolation rules for people traveling outside the province for work. But as case numbers elsewhere in Canada have begun to climb, we have brought in new measures to slow the spread of the illness. We have observed that working ret workers returning to the province frequently get a negative test result when tested immediately upon return, but then test positive a few days later. And in that interval, in that time span, they may have had contact with others without knowing they have COVID-19. So workers returning from outside the province will now be required to self-isolate for 14 days or until they have had a negative test result taken on day five to seven days after their arrival. If their stay in the province is longer than nine days, they must take two tests, one between five to seven days, and remain isolated until they have had a negative test result. It's very important that the self-isolation is completely uh, followed, and there, are, there is information on the website on how to do that safely. A second test will be required 10 to 12 days after arrival, and if that's negative, the person will not be required to self-isolate. Les travailleurs qui reviennent... Workers returning from outside the province will now be required to self-isolate until they have had a negative result on a test taken five to seven days after their arrival. If their stay in the province is longer than nine days, they must take a test at five to seven days. They must also remain isolated until they have had a negative result from a test taken 12, 10 to 12 days after their arrival. This will ensure we reduce the number of false negatives and prevent travelers from being in contact while they are most infectious. And I will remind you that everyone 
has to follow these rules uh, when they're traveling, not only those traveling for work. All non-essential travel remains subject to the 14-day self-isolation rules that have been in effect for several months. These actions are based on our learnings about COVID-19 with our own outbreaks and our evolving understanding of how we see it spreading in our province and elsewhere. Every day, this virus teaches us hard lessons. It shows us the cost of complacency. It shows us the error of thinking that the virus can't reach us. It shows us that we need to work together every day to keep COVID-19 from spreading across our province. I think what people really misguess and uh, make assumptions about is that if you don't hear about cases in your own community, then it's not there. By the time you find out, it is already there. And I don't know how many times I have said it, but I will continue to say it. You have to act like you have COVID-19 and that the people that you are interacting with have COVID-19 all the time. Le temps des fêtes approche. With the holiday season approaching, everyone wants to be with family and friends. This year, we need to do things differently. Everyone must reduce their close contacts. The people that we regularly spend time with while not wearing a mask or maintaining physical distance. This should be primarily those in your immediate household and as few as possible beyond that. There are, my counterparts across the country are imploring people right now to limit their number of close contacts. In places like British Columbia and Ontario, they are referring to it as your safe six. So this is how we are going to do this. We're going to limit our close contacts. In, that's the best way to slow the spread of COVID-19. So here's a suggestion. Take a few minutes each day to write down the names of those with whom you are in close contact. Uh, this number will surprise you. When contact tracers are contacting people who have come into close contact with somebody with COVID-19, they say things like, I haven't been anywhere, I haven't been out very much, I haven't seen very many people. But when they actually write down the list and the names, it is astounding. It can be upwards of 30 to 40 people. So we're hoping that we can whittle that down for most people in New Brunswick right now. And that is the best way for the entire province to stay in the yellow phase. Unfortunately for the zone one, they are going into the orange phase and they will have to limit their interactions with their household bubble. Everyone should aim to have this list be no longer than six people. Your safe six, the same six people. So knowing your contacts, will help reduce the opportunity for uncontrolled spread of the disease. As I have mentioned, once it's in your community, it's a bit late to start making these changes because it, once it's in your community, it's been there for a few days, if not longer. We also have to protect our Atlantic bubble, and that means avoiding non-essential travel in and out of the Atlantic region in the weeks ahead. Nova Scotia has gone as far as saying that they don't want students traveling in and out over the Christmas break. They have gone so far in PEI to say, please don't go to Moncton to shop, please don't go to Halifax to shop where there's community spread. Sadly, this is not the year to visit family members outside the region or invite them to come here. And this sounds harsh, and I, I, I fully understand that. But the alternative is more COVID-19 cases, like what we are seeing in other provinces in this country and all around the world. Overwhelmed hospitals and healthcare workers, more sickness and death, and potentially another province-wide lockdown. No one wants these things to happen. COVID-19 spreads so very, very quickly, but it spreads with each individual who is making decisions every single day as to whether to wear a mask, whether to go out of their household to do things that are non-essential, whether they're interacting with people in groups or not, and whether or not their close contact numbers are low, whether or not they're getting tested, even if they have mild symptoms. So let's keep working together. We are facing a long and difficult winter. Now is the time to think about getting outside as much as you possibly can, whatever winter activities you can participate in outdoors. We have hope. We are looking forward to when the vaccine is available for all New Brunswickers, but we know that's going to be a lengthy process in 2021, but that is what we're looking forward to. That is our goal. Make it to that time frame with everybody uh, working together. We must not falter with the finish line in sight. Please reduce your number of close contacts right now. When you are with others outside your home, wear a mask and maintain two meters of physical distance. Wash your hands and follow other public health directions. All around the world, lockdowns are happening. 
and it is heartbreaking to see, but it doesn't have to happen here if we work together and stay strong. Thank you. Merci. Bonjour. Good afternoon. In recent days, we have once again seen an increase in number of cases in our province, particularly in Zone 1, the Moncton region. When we look at what's happening around us, the rise here in New Brunswick isn't surprising news. The no New Brunswick's number of cases is relatively low compared to other provinces. But COVID-19 will not disappear overnight. This reminds us that we must be vigilant to make sure that the number of cases stays under control and is easy to manage. We have heard positive news about progress with a vaccine, but we do not expect a vaccine to be widely available until next year. In the meantime, we need to be buying time. We need to keep our outbreaks under control and secure our bubble. As Dr. Russell said, we are so close we are within 100 days or, or less, or, or maybe slightly more, but we are so close. We see every day news around a vaccine. We cannot lose focus now. We've brought attention to our entire province. People are looking at New Brunswick for the first time for the great attention and willpower and conviction that every resident here has shown in, in keeping our, our province safe. Our time is not to relax those efforts. After meeting with the All-Party Cabinet Committee on COVID-19 and with Cabinet, we have made the decision to move Zone 1 back to the orange level, effective at midnight tonight. Based on the advice of public health, we have made some changes to all three levels of recovery. These, these challenge or changes will apply to Zone 1 as well as any zone in the future that moves to the orange level. Under the orange phase, Wearing a mask will be mandatory in all indoor and outdoor public spaces. People must stay within a single household bubble, which can be extended to caretakers or immediate family members requiring support. We are seeing increased numbers of cases amongst younger age groups. We're hearing of gatherings, of parties, of events. Age groups often in their 20s to 29 range. That's what we're seeing across the country. We're seeing kind of a relaxation of, of the rules for, for this age group. Often these cases are covering from gatherings such as household with friends and extended family. C'est pourquoi il est important. This is why it is important that all Zone 1 residents stay within their single household bubble as much as possible, at least until we can contain the spread of the virus. All indoor gatherings outside of the single household bubble are permitted. However, formal gatherings of up to 25 people are allowed for weddings, funerals, and faith-based services with an operational plan in place. Restaurants, dining rooms will be permitted to remain open. However, a single household bubble must be maintained while dining out. Personal services, such as hairstylists, as well as non-regulated health professionals, may remain open as long as they have an operational plan outlining enhanced measures, such as active screening of patrons, closed waiting rooms, and enhanced barriers. Les lieux de Entertainment places may remain open as long as they conduct their businesses in a safe manner and that they follow their operational plan. They must limit the number of patrons to 50 people, maintain a physical distance of at least two meters between everyone present, and maintain a register of clients. Public spaces such as libraries can also remain open if they maintain a physical distance of two meters. Venues such as gyms are allowed to stay open as long as they are operating safely as per their operational plan with additional mitigation strategies such as two meters of distance. 
for low intensity fitness classes like yoga and three meters for high intensity activities like spin classes. Fitness centers must have active screening measures in place. Keep a record of patrons and close locker rooms and other common areas. Sports teams must limit their activities to practice within a single team. Faith venues may hold in-person services with up to 50 participants as long as two meters of distancing is maintained and everyone wears a mask. However, no singing is permitted. There's Public transport services can remain open, but passengers must maintain a distance of at least one meter and they must wear a mask. The rest of the province outside of zone one remains in the yellow level, but we are also introducing a few changes to this level based on the advice of public health. Informal indoor gatherings of up to 20 people are permitted and close contact should be small limited to a consistent list of family and friends. It is important that we all make an effort to limit our number of close contacts as much as possible. We have seen several cases in New Brunswick where people tested positive and had more than 30 close contacts. And to the recommendation of Dr. Russell, keeping a record of your contacts can surprise you of just how many you have in a short period of time. This increases the risk of community transmission. And then it becomes much harder to find everyone who might have been exposed to the virus and to make sure that they self-isolate if necessary. Under the new yellow level guidelines, sport teams can continue to play following their operational plan, and tournaments or larger events may be permitted subject to the approval of the plan. Faith venues can continue to stay open as long as one meter of distance is maintained and everyone is wearing a mask. However, masks must be worn and two meters of distance must be in place for singing to be permitted. Otherwise, no singing is allowed. When using public transportation, the continuous use of a mask is required and passengers should ensure space is available for people who will require two meters of distancing for medical reasons, such as those who are immunocompromised. No matter which level a zone is in, businesses, employers, and organizations must ensure employees wear a mask in common areas and when they cannot maintain two meters of distance. Masks are mandatory at staff meetings and in staff rooms and they are mandatory for all patrons and visitors. Businesses can help to limit contact between their employees by maintaining assigned work shifts when possible. Within the orange phase, employees should avoid using common spaces during breaks or meals. For regions in the yellow phase, employees should try to limit their contacts during breaks and maintain a physical distance of two meters. Employers should also ensure their ventilation system servicing is up to date and check their airflows. Non-essential travel in and out of, our, of an orange zone should be limited. People living in an orange zone are asked to avoid any non-essential travel to other zones. However, New Brunswickers can continue to travel within the province for work, school, essential errands, and medical appointments. As Dr. Russell explained, we are also introducing important changes to the testing and isolation guidelines for New Brunswick workers returning to the province after working outside of the Atlantic bubble. This month alone, under the previous guidelines, more than 60% of the workers following modified self-isolation rules who tested negative one day uh, on day one later tested positive between days five to seven. Between those tests, they were able to move freely through the community, which has put us all at greater risk of coming into contact with COVID-19. 
en voiture, des nouvelles lignes. Under the new guidelines, we will allow New Brunswick workers to enjoy their short stay in their home province while limiting the virus spread in a more efficient way. These rules may seem strict, but when we look at what is happening in other provinces, we have to put in place these safety measures. In Alberta, for example, there are more than 10,000 active cases right now. If the equivalent situation happened in New Brunswick, according for this, uh, accounting for the size of our population, we would have more than 1,700 cases and our healthcare system would be overwhelmed. We have to do everything we can to ensure New Brunswickers aren't exposed to this high level of risk. There have been uh, small increases in the number of cases in the Atlantic provinces, but overall the Atlantic bubble is intact. Everyone has a duty to do their part so that this situation does not change. We still have an enviable situation here in New Brunswick and in all of Atlantic Canada. We've achieved this by working together and we can continue this by working together. I know it's not easy. Universities are back. Social lifestyles are demanding changes. We just need to be diligent. For a few more months, let the vaccine have time to arrive. Let's keep this together. We are the envy of our country. We're the envy of, of other countries. Let's not lose it with being irresponsible at this point. Let's make sure we arrive safely when the vaccine arrives and everyone arrives with us. Thank you. Merci. Thank you, Premier. Before we proceed, can everybody please mute your microphones? Merci. Thank you. We'll now proceed with questions from the members of the media. Each reporter will have one question today. You have the right to pose your question in the language of your choice. Nous allons maintenant Vous avez toujours le droit de poser votre question dans la langue de votre choix. Chaque journaliste peut poser une question. Vicky Hogarth, Charlotte County TV. Thank you, Bruce. My question is for the Premier. Premier Higgs. With cases continuing to rise in Washington County, Maine, the seasonal ferry to Campobello ending on December 1st and already not running on days like today and yesterday when there's high wind, Campobello Islanders are concerned about how this will impact their lives this, this winter. Many Islanders are already reporting being denied services from dentist appointments to eye exams on the mainland. After screening reveals they've traveled to the U.S., are you reconsidering working to secure a year-round ferry to Camp at Bello? And is it okay for me when this is to deny services to Islanders who travel through the U.S.? So firstly, we don't want any services to be denied for, for um, residents of Campobello Island when they're trying to get those services here in the province. So I am very interested to understand any case where that is happening. We have, we have gone through great effort to ensure that the border crossings, the officials there understand the, uh, the significance of um, residents of Campobello being able to come back and forth as they always did. And also the residents recognizing that, that stopping in, in Maine is a risk and, and so we're asking to drive straight through in both ways back and forth. So I want to understand those cases, and we've asked for, for any contacts, any to, to connect with our with the local MA, connect on our COVID website, but make us be well aware because we will deal directly with that. We know that going into winter season, the ferry operation will be unreliable. Uh, extending the operation is is not likely the solution because of going into winter. But I want to know if there are cases that are not being allowed and services are not being provided uh, because that, that is unacceptable. Thank you, Premier. Thank you, Ms. Hogarth. Travis Fortnum, Global News. Hi there. My question is for Dr. Russell. Um, a bar in St. John is uh, notifying people through social media that there was possible COVID-19 exposure uh, there this 
weekend, this past weekend. And they say they're working with public health and following their advice. I'm wondering if you can confirm that the details that they provided. Okay, Travis, before we start, everybody please mute your mic. We can hear someone typing on their keyboard and it's very frustrating for your fellow colleagues. Thank you. Dr. Russell? So I, um, I can't comment on specific cases or situations. All I can tell you in a general sense is that if public health is aware of public exposures because of contact tracing, et cetera, public health makes a public announcement about public exposures. Uh, individuals who have COVID-19 are contacted individually. Their close contacts are contacted individually. If there is a workplace or an institution, an organization, uh, a business involved, uh, communication would happen directly with that business or with that organization directly from public health. So I can only comment on situations that I'm aware of where there's a public exposure and then public health will be announcing that uh, to the public. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Fordham. Sarah Seely, Times and Transcript. Uh, so my question is for Dr. Russell. Uh, I was wondering uh, if KCCC who uh, works in the one, if uh, masks will be made mandatory in gyms and fitness facilities while um, workouts are underway. I can't, I couldn't hear you. Can you repeat the question, please? Sarah, can you repeat it, please? Sure. I was wondering if uh, cases continue to worsen in the Zone 1 region, uh, if mandatory masks will be made um, possible in fitness facilities while workouts are underway, rather than just in common areas. Uh, well, gyms will be open in, uh, in the orange phase in Zone 1, uh, but they have to have an operational plan, et cetera, and uh, we have more details on gyms uh, in, in the information that we're putting on the website, uh, and if, the, if it becomes necessary to go that route, that would be another discussion that we would have later. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Seeley. Laura Lyle, CTV News. Hi, thank you. Uh, this question would be either for Dr. Russell or uh, Premier Hicks. Uh, I'm just looking for a little bit of clarity on the close contact um, information. Um, there is there is um, advice about uh, having a safe sex through the holidays, um, as well about um, informal indoor gatherings of up to 20 people. Um, I just I, I've noticed the comments um, just as I'm tweeting, um, just a little bit of confusion about that. Um, so I'm just looking for a little bit of clarity as to how, um, I guess, how many contacts we should be close with. Well, in terms of what we would be enforcing, it would be the 20, but I am suggesting to go even lower than that. Uh, this virus is spreading like wildfire across the country, is spreading in the U.S., record number of cases every day, record numbers of deaths globally every day, lockdowns in the U.K. and Europe. So I would suggest that everybody take stock of how many close contacts they have, write them down, make a list, and in places like B.C. and Ontario, they're suggesting six consistent people uh, separate from your household. So that is, the, that is what we are suggesting. Thank you, Ms. Lyle. Thank you, Dr. Liam Floyd, The Huddle. Liam Floyd. Nature Roi Como, La Quedzi Nouvelle. Hello, my question is for Dr. Russell. Can you tell us more on what's happening right now at the Oasis residence? You spoke of an outbreak. Can you tell us what measures are being taken and what the situation is like over there? So the information I have is that there is one case. When there is one case in a facility such as this one, there is a process that is put in place. It's the same process that we had to put in place with the Manuel La Valle and so on. Our, our screening team goes out there. I believe there are 63 residents and 34 staff members. They will all be tested today with rapid testing. 
and this will continue. They will be tested every uh, other day to make sure that there are no more cases within the facility. Thank you, Monsieur Como. CBC. Good afternoon. My question is for Dr. Russell. Uh, you spoke about the tighter rules for people traveling for work. Uh, we're hearing about inconsistent advice from public health about whether all people need to isolate while they wait for their COVID test results. I'm just wondering, can you please clarify what the rules are? Yes, so in the summer when we relaxed the rules about self-isolation, it was really targeted at workers who would go away for two weeks and then come back. And when they were away for those two weeks, they would be work isolating. They would not be allowed to do anything but go to and from work. And then when we, they would come back to the province, then they would have to self-isolate for 14 days and not be with their family. And then they'd have to go back again. So it was quite uh, damaging uh, from a mental health perspective. So because the case numbers were low in the summer, we allowed uh, a, a relaxed um, uh, protocol around that type of traveler and that type of worker. Uh, in the meantime, the risks have gone up all over Canada and, and uh, elsewhere in the U.S. and, and globally. So we changed uh, the protocols so that people would be tested on day one and then they wouldn't have to self-isolate, but they'd still have to be tested on day five to seven and then again um, on day um, 10 or so, uh, 10 to 12, uh, if they were going to be in the province for longer than 14 days. What we have noticed uh, with the data that we've collected and what we've seen with cases uh, connected with uh, travelers in that particular scenario is that uh, people would test negative on day one and then by day five they tested positive and by then they had been interacting with close contacts and, and would have uh, transmitted COVID that way in that time frame. So now everybody who's traveling for work has to self-isolate for that first five days until they get tested and get that result and then they don't have have to self-isolate after that, but they still will have to get tested uh, 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 on between day 10 and 12 as well. So we are requiring um, them to, uh, it's a change from what we were talking about before in terms of work isolation. This is actual self-isolation. So uh, that has to be away from their family. In other jurisdictions, they are really requiring that either the whole family isolate together, uh, which we actually have in our mandatory order with respect to if you don't have a self-isolation plan that is safe and executable in your home uh, in terms of not having to share bathrooms, et cetera, then you could self-isolate in your household. Uh, but if you can't really guarantee that you're not going to be interacting because of not being able to uh, have enough space, then your, your household would have to isolate with you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Ms. Sutherland. Erica Butler, CHMA Hi, Sackville. Hi, thank you. Um, so between Tuesday and Wednesday, um, the stats on the province's COVID dashboard under case origin changed the number of community transmission, transmission cases from 13 to 14. Um, can you give any further information about that case, such as what zone it was in? And I'm just wondering why that information was not included in the daily update. So with respect to all of the cases that are active currently, they're either travel related or close contacts of travelers. There are a few cases that are still under investigation, so we haven't declared them as being community transmission. So, and I haven't seen that part of the dashboard in terms of what that number shows. But what we are aware of is that people do want to know what the what the pattern has been. So I did ask our, our, our team looked at it from an epidemiological perspective. And in November, we had over 70% of travel um, uh, travel-related self-isolation exempt cases, and then there was no self-isolation due to the federal exemption. And some of those had over 30 contacts. And of those who were under modified isolation, over 60% had a negative day one test and then later tested positive during the day five to seven test. And in between day one and the day five test, there were there was no, under, no isolation. And so um, what we're talking about in terms of border measures and uh, isolation is uh, the situation around the travel that we're seeing when it's work related. There is another set of travelers obviously that are traveling for reasons other than work. Um, but 
all of the cases up until now are either travel related or they are close contacts of travelers and the rest are pretty much still under investigation. In our outbreak in zone five, uh, it took almost four weeks to establish uh, links to the cases. Uh, there were at least at one point there were five unlinked chains of transmission. Uh, and by the end of the outbreak, um, by week four, after in interviewing people several times, they were finally able to make those links. But what we know now is in Halifax there is community transmission and community spread. Uh, we are calling this a community, um, uh, a community outbreak. So we're, we, there is uh, different parts of the community that are affected in terms of exposures and um, and the way that the virus is transmitting in Zone One. So in terms of active cases, we have 43 active cases in the province right now. 24 of them are in Zone One, uh, seven in Zone Two, nine in Zone Three, and two in Zone Six and one in Zone Seven. Thank you, Ms. Butler. Thank you, Doctor. François Leblanc, Radio-Canada. Hello. My question is for Dr. Jennifer Russell. We heard today that there was a New Brunswick hockey team member that had received a positive uh, COVID test result. A lot of parents are worried, and to put it politely, they're angry that there was not any rapid action taken to make sure that no other player or team would be in contact with this player or team. So people are questioning the speed at which you can react. That team played many times against other teams. Um, other teams that came after could have come into contact with them. So could you please comment on this situation, ex explain to us what the process is and how it works? Yes, I would like parents to know that as soon as we have a positive case, close contacts are contacted by public health. Because we're talking about hockey teams or any sports, really, there is a list that is given with the operational plan regardless of, of the sport or situation. So if parents are worried or if their child has been in contact with someone who tested positive, public health will get in touch with them directly. So if they have not received a call from public health, it's it's a process that's done within the 24 hours after the positive test. So for anyone who's worried, I can say that if there are any close contact between team members, they will be contacted by public health nursing staff and will be uh, told to isolate at home. So after the player tested positive, then all the close contacts are immediately contacted. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Merci, Dr. Bobby G. McKinnon, CBC. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Russell, you refer to wanting to reduce the number of cases from traveling workers. How many cases were missed and are these the problem in Zone 1? Well, they aren't the only um, thing that is contributing to the increased number of cases, but they are contributing. So, so t all cases are imported at this point in time. Uh, in terms of how COVID gets into New Brunswick. So that's not going to change throughout the pandemic We, because we have been successful at, at um, containing outbreaks and um, and then being able to declare them over and then the, the zone that's involved goes back to the yellow phase. So we are going to see this continuously throughout the pandemic. So we know that travel-related cases, whether it's from workers or other people, uh, can infect uh, people after they return back to New Brunswick from outside the Atlantic bubble. So we know that's that can happen. Again, if it's a worker uh, who is self-isolating um, at this point in time, because we've changed the rules, we're going to pick up uh, those cases on day five to seven when they get tested. They will be self-isolating throughout that time period. Because we weren't, ha prior to the testing strategy uh, that started to test travelers, uh, workers, uh, they didn't have to self-isolate at all. And so there were much, much higher risks before. And, and as we see the number of cases go up around the country, these risks are, are becoming very, very high. So in order to manage those risks, that's why the testing was implemented. So in November, in the month of November, we have had uh, over 60% of the travel-related, um, the people who were exempt from self-isolation, 
meaning they'd had no, no uh, self-isolation due to the federal exemption. And um, I'm just saying of those, some of them had uh, con close contacts of up to 30 people. That doesn't mean that every single one of those people is going to test positive, but certainly that means that they're all self-isolating at home now as a result. And then um, there was a, a, about 60% uh, of the people who ended up getting tested, um, they tested negative on day one, and then on day five they tested positive. So there is a 60% of those people who had modified self-isolation. Uh, there would have been a period of time when they were uh, uh, contagious and uh, able to transmit COVID during that time. So we are seeing some cases as, as a result of that. And that's why we are changing the um, the testing to make sure that people are tested, have to self-isolate until they get that day five test. Um, what we also know in terms of the transmission patterns, and again, we analyzed this in, in zone five at the time, so we could really communicate very, very specifically and clearly with the population so they understood this is how the transmission is happening, this is what the population needs to do to address that. So the other places, as the Premier has mentioned, we are seeing links to recreational events, sporting events, gatherings. Um, in zone five, it was a lot of, there were a lot of family connections, so people were gathering in homes. Uh, sometimes it was uh, employers, it, it, rather employees and colleagues gathering outside of work. Sometimes it was um, on breaks uh, at work. But now we're seeing um, uh, transmission with respect to sports teams and uh, gatherings. And so we really, really need people to limit their number of close contacts at this point in time to limit the spread. Thank you, Ms. McKinnon. Thank you, Dr. Tom Bateman. Time to transcript. Oh, hi there. For Dr. Russell, uh, if I heard you right, I believe you said that uh, this year is not the year to visit family members outside of the region uh, or for them to visit you. Uh, for Christmas this year. What do you mean by region? Do you mean health region, like zone one, two, three, four, and five? Do you mean the province? Do you mean outside of the bubble? Uh, and, and do you anticipate making more firm recommendations uh, if people are kind of confused by that? So what I'm trying to echo is the same sentiment and recommendation that is uh, happening in Newfoundland, PEI, and Nova Scotia. The Atlantic bubble is fragile, and that is not a surprise, that is not new. Uh, to protect the Atlantic bubble in terms of travel-related cases, we have to continue to limit essential, non-essential travel. We've done a great job, we've, we've limited our, we've decreased our travel by 80%. That's a significant amount, and we'd like it to keep it that way, and we know that the holiday season is a time that people want to travel to see their loved ones, and what the entire Atlantic bubble, all of the leaders are saying, please don't do that. Um, we really, really want to limit people traveling out of the Atlantic bubble uh, because then when they come back, again, the risk of bringing uh, COVID-19 with them is there. And we really uh, have a really hard time of, of making sure that we can keep it under control once outbreaks start because they can go so quickly. And again, looking at what's happening in the rest of the country, being overwhelmed, you know, back in the summer, if people had a desire to travel, we weren't necessarily discouraging them. They could go away and come back and do their self-isolation. But that was before the record number of daily cases uh, was being recorded in most every province in this country. And several provinces are wanting to go into lockdown. Many provinces... Uh, healthcare systems are overwhelmed, and the chief medical officers of health in those provinces are imploring people to limit your close contact numbers and, and try to get things under control and don't travel for any non-essential reasons. Don't go anywhere for any non-essential reason. So all of the Atlantic provinces, again, would like to protect the integrity of the Atlantic bubble. It is fragile. We all have um, a limited number of resources, and we want to protect our healthcare system, we want to protect our economy, we want to keep our schools open. Uh, so we have a lot to lose, and so that is why we are sending this message uh, in terms of our recommendations and our suggestions at this point in time. Thank you, Tom. Tori Weldon, CBC. Hello, this question is for Dr. Russell. Um, it's basically Francois' question, but if I could just get the answer in English, having to do with uh, when it comes to um, contact tracing with kids at sports, and I guess I would also like to know like, how long it takes to do that sort of thing. So the process and then the length of time expected to take. 
Uh, well, in a general sense, contact tracing is done within 24 hours. So uh, as soon as somebody's diagnosed as positive, they are contacted and all of their close contacts are directly contacted by public health. Thank you, Ms. Weldon. Sophie Desautels, Radio-Canada. Oh, I'm sorry, Bonjour. Bonjour. Could you? Sorry, I'm like, you, you, your answer to Francois, what you said in uh, French there, would you just be able to repeat it in English, just what the process is? Would you be able to do that? That was for the hockey team. Can you repeat it in English, what you said in French? Whether it's a hockey team or a soccer team or a business or a school or an institution or an adult residential facility, etc., all of the contact tracing for a positive case occurs the same way. As soon as we get the results of a co positive COVID-19 case, we contact that individual. We get the list of contacts, close contacts and phone numbers, and we contact those people within 24 hours, and they are all then um, uh, directed to self-isolate immediately. Uh, if any of them have symptoms, they would be encouraged to get tested at that time. If there is a notification between a business or an organization or institution, that does happen directly from public health to that organization. And the only time that public health will put out any kind of a public exposure notification is if there has been an exposure in a public setting that we are worried about uh, where we weren't, we weren't confident that we would have been able to reach any type of close contacts uh, that would have been exposed in that type of setting. Thank you. Thank you, Tori. Sophie Deshotel. Yes, hi. My question is for Dr. Russell. You talked about a case in the Residence Oasis. We've received confirmation that there is a case in the St. Thérèse School of Moncton Daycare. Can you confirm? Can you confirm this positive case? And why haven't you talked about it today? Thank you for the question. There is one confirmed case in a daycare. And all the people involved have been directly and individually contacted. Thank you. Marie-Ève Brassard, Radio-Canada. Excuse me, I, Sophie Desautel here. I didn't get an answer. Why haven't you talked about this case in a daycare? Every person affected has received a letter from public health, so there is no risk for members of the public. Marie-Ève Brassard. Hello. My question is for Dr. Russell. First of all, I would like to know if it's possible that when public health gets in touch with a business where a patron has tested positive, that one business be told that they have to shut down for 24 hours and another business not receive these guidelines. How does that happen? Situations are different. It's the same with restaurant inspections. When an inspector goes to see a restaurant and tells them that something needs to be fixed, they receive very specific instructions, and they're specific to each situation, so I couldn't really comment on these situations. Every situation is different. Thank you. Geneviève Normand, Radio Canada. Yes, thank you. My question is actually for Premier Higgs. I'm hearing, Premier, that um, I want to go back to actually Vicky's question that Campobello residents are being told, um, as of today anyway, that they need to self-isolate for 14 days if they want to obtain essentials in Maine, like fill up their car. Do you think that makes sense? And if so, what are you going to do? Well, we, we have encouraged them not to, to stop in Maine and not to, um, you know, to have groceries or or to actually um, fill up their car if they can avoid that, and if they're transiting to come straight through into into uh, into uh, St. Stephen. Uh, however, there we have allowed them to do that and then come back back into Camp uh, into uh, Campobello. So so that is the current. Those are the current rules. So if if they're being uh, 
I guess, forced to isolate, then I, I, I said I said earlier, I want to know what those cases are because we have to allow the residents to, to proceed as normal. But we are saying, you know, normal should be into, in this COVID world, given the situation in Maine, it should be traveling right through and into back into New Brunswick. Merci, Geneviève. Harry Forstel, CBC. So thank, you for thank you for taking my call. Um, when I spoke with you yesterday, Dr. Russell, we talked about uh, the situation of the spread and its involvement of young people. You said we do still see people who are going to workplaces with symptoms, who are not staying home when they're ill and not getting tested when they're ill. And this is what we saw in the outbreaks in Zone 5 and 1 a few weeks ago. We are seeing the number of cases in young people. We're also seeing that in Nova Scotia uh, and many of the cases in young people aged 20 to 35. Could you explain how big a factor that age range is currently in the spread of COVID-19? Well, certainly when you look at the outbreak uh, in Zone 5 previously, it was a combination of three different things that were contributing to the spread, uh, including people not getting tested when they have mild symptoms, people not wearing their masks when they were working with their colleagues um, in non-public facing areas or on breaks, and then also uh, the, the large number of close contacts. So what we're seeing in this Zone 1 outbreak at this time, same drivers in terms of uh, large numbers of close contacts. It happens to be in a younger age group. Um, and the other thing is still we're seeing people that have mild symptoms who are not getting tested and still um, uh, going out and about and interacting with people and, and having close contact with people, uh, whether in a workplace or socially. And um, and again, we're seeing the, the travel-related, work travel-related uh, pieces of this, and we're addressing that with the, the testing, uh, the changes in the trust testing strategy right now. Has the news of the imminent availability of viable vaccines uh, worked to undermine the efforts that your office is trying to make? Sorry, Harry, can you repeat that? Has the news of the imminent availability of viable vaccines uh, undermined the discipline that uh, we've had in this province so far? I would hope not. I can't imagine that it would. I, I think um, some people might uh, attribute the uh, the perhaps complacency or perhaps not understanding the increased risks. Um, I, I feel like people don't understand that the travel-related cases, whether it's for workers, essential travelers, or otherwise, that that is how COVID-19 will, will get here. Um, is there a risk of community transmission from elsewhere inside the bubble? Well, in Halifax right now, they have community transmission. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say that the vaccine is undermining. I think the vaccine gives people hope, but I hope it helps people be energized and rejuvenated in, in terms of their uh, renewed efforts in terms of being very vigilant right now as we see globally and nationally numbers of cases increase. I am going to come back to the question about masks in gyms and requiring mask use in gyms will need to be part of an enhanced operational plan in in order to stay open in the orange phase. So that question came up earlier around gyms being allowed to be open in orange, but it will be part of the enhanced operational plan in order to stay open in that orange phase. But thanks for your question, Harry. Again, I, I feel like the, the vaccine is something that provides hope to people. We know that the rollout will be very different uh, based on different priorities in the province, but also across the country. And we know that it will take a long time because there are different types of vaccines. Um, and when that the rollout of that could take up to a year. That concludes today's update. Cela conclut la séance d'aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much.